Fire in clay has been amongst the few mediums to have persevered through thousands of years. The Korea Society is proud to present this fall three contemporary ceramic artists who are pursuing their own exploration with clay while reshaping the tradition and transcending the stereotype of the medium. Jenny Beck, Steve Young Lee, and Sun Gu Yeol offer new perspectives shaped by cultural and social influences and reflect the shifting emphasis within the practice of ceramic art. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are honored and thrilled to have you all in our exhibition and for this artist talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. So to start off, um, can you briefly describe the type of ceramic art you specialize and sort of your artistic background? Why don't we start with Steve? Sure. Um, my work is primarily uh, based in porcelain, use, use of porcelain as a material. Um, I make sculptural vessels, um, I would say is kind of the main focus of my work, but I'm also involved with making functional and utilitarian wear, um, but typically uh, decorated with uh, different motifs from a variety of different cultures around the world. Um, hi, I'm Jani, and I uh, have a background in ceramics as an undergrad. Um, then I went to grad school for architecture and worked in architecture for a number of years, and um, I'm relatively new to ceramics. I started um, in earnest doing ceramics during the pandemic, and I make um, sculptural vessels um, that are primarily made from um, colored stoneware and colored porcelain um, with a lot of emphasis on uh, natural forms and transformation. My name is Sun Gu Yao. I'm making uh, all different kind of you know work, which is uh, monumental uh, stoneware sculptures to figurative uh, porcelain you know sculptures, and uh, also I make some functional wear after pandemic. So, what initially drew you all to working with clay mm -hmm. as a medium? Actually. Uh, the, the artist was not my first choice mm -hmm. <laughs> as an occupation. And it uh, seems like, you know, oh, when I was young, uh, art living as an artist seems like, you know, very uh, meaningful to me. And uh, I become a, a art student, but I didn't know what medium I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. And I experienced uh, all different mediums then, uh, I touch the clay, and that uh, first things you know I can touch it and manipulate you know dramatically, and very spontaneously, and that's you know draw me to this medium. Then I fall in love with that, and also you know uh, firing kilns and that's involved with the fire, and it seems like you know there's uh, so many uh, unexpected things happen in this process somehow I felt, you know, it's a parallel to our life, then very meaningful to me, whole procedure. So that's what I, you know, start. And uh, Well, I, I, I've also always wanted to be an artist. Um, and I, I always really loved ceramics and clay, but I think that I always felt like, um, maybe I should do something more uh, professional. Uh, even when I was at RISD, I actually majored in architecture briefly, and then I ended up going into ceramics. Um, and then I, as I said, I, I went to school and worked as an architect for a number of years before then coming back to ceramics. So my husband, who's also my architecture partner, um, says that I just did architecture as a way of avoiding admitting that I just wanted to do ceramics. Um, so I, I think that um, ultimately it's, I think it's my most natural way of communicating. Um, it's the, the thing that I think that ultimately I have the most, um, the best way uh, to sort of give of myself more than sitting at a computer or, you know, going to meetings and things like that, I feel like it is more meaningful, a more meaningful way of communicating for me. 
Well, I think for myself, um, there's a bit of a thread where I think, uh, you know, my parents never wanted me to become an artist, even though uh, my father was a graphic designer and my mom studied art in college. And uh, so I think there was a presence of it in my household growing up. But, you know, always we were being sort of encouraged to be in more professional fields. And um, but I do remember when I was younger, like my dad was an amazing drawer and I never felt like I had that ability, but I do remember very distinctly when I was a kid playing with clay and just the responsiveness of the material being very natural for me. And um, which, you know, I didn't really think much of, about it until later when I started to take it more seriously. And then um, when I started to throw on the wheels, when I became very like obsessive about learning how to sort of manipulate the material. And, um, and I think it's a similar reason is that, you know, it's such a direct tactile kind of expression that you're kind of recording marks with your fingertips mm -hmm. immediately, you know, and, um, and I think the, just the history of it all, like, as I've, you know, kind of evolved in my career, like understanding how it connects you to like prehistoric craftsmen or artists or, you know, and we're all kind of dealing with the same basic elemental materials and, and, uh, techniques. Um, it hasn't changed that much, you know, like it, that transformation into ceramic from clay is, is pretty basic, but really like exciting, you know, just to kind of see the, the many iterations of that. So then how would you describe your artistic process from the conceptual phase to completing a piece? For me, I think that some of it is planned, you know, through just experience. I think of continuing to work in the material and building some familiarity with it so that you are always gauging like where the limits are, you know, or where there are areas that you can try to like, hopefully see something you haven't experienced before. Um, so for me, like a lot of it, it's hard to escape experience, right? So you're learning certain things in making the work, but, um, but I'm always hoping to try to keep some element of like surprise and as Sangu said, like once things go into the kiln, it's completely out of your hands and you just never are quite sure what the results are going to be. And I think that's, it's almost a bit of a sickness that you keep coming back to it. And like, <laughs> it's either better than you expected or it's worse, or it just, it just challenges you in that way. So you always have to be a little bit on your toes, a little bit open, you know, to uh, new kind of experiences. And that's the part I think that keeps it from being monotonous, you know, and it's uh it's like Christmas every time you open the kiln, mm -hmm. <laughs> or in a good and bad way, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The most important part of it for me is um, keeping a very um, active um, sketching sketchbook process. Um, I really, uh, I really like value, and I feel really like um, protective of like my like solitude and sort of peace of mind and uh, ability to have like the freedom to just like think about things in my sketchbook and so I draw a lot or you know as much as I can I'm not good at drawing and I uh, they're not supposed to be good drawings they're just kind of like ideas and I really feel like that's like the genesis of my um practice and then when I go and it's not even I'm not even drawing the stuff I'm gonna make necessarily but just kind of having like a non-judgmental way of like thinking and then um, when I go into the studio I really refer back to those that kind of freedom uh, a lot that I had when I was thinking and then of course like making uh, trying to make something is like then a totally different uh, challenge. Um, but I really, um, I think that's the sort of basis of my, my work. Mm, to, to me, I mean, recent, you know, practice, uh, I often make uh, sculptures, my ceramic sculptures out of uh, drawings, which I drawn very intuitively and spontaneously with the ink and brush. Right? So it's kind of, you know, if I'm in the zone, you know, someday, <laughs> right, I can draw many, you know, uh, images, just, you know, something like I, I kind of burn it in some images, you know, inside from me. And I put it up, those images on the wall of my studio. 
and in and out and kind of contemplate it, you know, what's the meaning. And sometimes I choose. I have a guts, you know, and building it up slowly. And I choose a few drawings to make uh, kind of, you know, three-dimensional forms. And the images I see is, uh, you know, conscious and unconscious concern in my life, I think, you know, or relationship with, you know, people around me. And I just make a kind of, you know, two-dimensional image, but uh, I can pull and push that, you know, that create three-dimensional space and make uh, uh, all-around sculpture. And I think, you know, my works for a while, I mean, trying to, you know, transform some inner image to tangible kind of, you know, sculpture. So Zongwa, I wanted to ask you about all these different figures in your art, you know, just in the pieces that we have in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. There's Monkey King, there's Rabbit, there are flowers, there's Tokebi, there's angels. Mm -hmm. Like it's they seem to be inspired by so many different places and time, different cultures. So what are your influences and how do you integrate all these different components into mm. your art? As I said, it's, you know, intuitively it mm. came out. But uh, if I think back and, you know, it's, I grew up in Korea and came here when I was 28 years old. And I was a grown up person, actually. Then I lived here a little longer than that. You know, so I, culturally, I mixed up, <laughs> right? <laughs> so influenced, you know, by Western and Eastern. And when I came here, actually, I thought about uh, a lot of, you know, about my identity uh, as a Korean, right? So I thought about uh, what's real Korean, uh, what I have, you know, from my ancestors. And I got the... Uh, one thing, you know, really greatly affects, influenced me is a uh, Minhwa, which is a uh, folk painting, Yi Dynasty, you know, uh, Joseon Dynasty folk painting. Which, uh, and there's all there. There's a symbols there, colors there, and uh, there's a basic human kind of desires there, like uh, longevity, fertility, good marriages, all those well-beings, you know. And it seems like, you know, that's a fundamental kind of, you know, issues. Then after that, uh, I, if I have a kind of mundane issues every day, then it pops up in the images. So it coexists, you know, that the uh, fundamental human desires and, you know, kind of uh, everyday lives, you know, experiences. And through the years, I borrowed those, you know, images from Asian so zodiac animals, you know, that the year of rat, I just make rats, you know, <laughs> in my sculpture. And there's a good, you know, dokebis is also, you know, Asian influence and tigers and I don't know, chasung saja, what, what we call that chasung saja? I mean... Oh. All those e images oh, I borrow, Ripper. yeah, mm. oh. borrow from that, you know, the folk painting. And through the years, I also, you know, create my own images, I think, you know. So there's a bird, which is, which is a wicked bird, and mischief, you know, things around us always we have, then something like that. So I don't know, but, you know, it's slowly, collectively, I kind of add more images, I think. And I really wish we could have had more bigger pieces of yours, but it was just not logistically possible. But some of your sculptures are massive, um, and some of them are quite smaller in scale. So when you're creating this sort of three-dimensional piece, what is what do you think is the relationship between your art and the space it occupies? I, I honestly, no, I don't think that much about it. I mean, a space. But uh, uh, clay is uh, really, you know, limited, you know, material. And uh, when I was young, I didn't understood about the material pretty much. Then it was my mission, I think, right? How we can break down or, you know, 
expand our boundaries of the, that limitation we have. So I was interested in architectural ceramics. Mm -hmm. You know, architectural ceramics always in the history, but uh, you know, I just wanted to push my boundary. So, you know, there's uh, some way I invent, you know, to create large, you know, scale work. And uh, the, the one of the reason, you know, not many people can make large scale work is a drying. So if someone who, you know, control dryness, right, hydrate and dehydrate, we can control that, then, you know, longer period of time, I can work and make larger pieces. So I invented, you know, somehow some the techniques and able to make a big work. But uh, I like small sculpture too. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, very intimate, you know, the small things we use every day and appreciate. And sometimes as a small sculpture, we put it in our, you know, uh, room and watch it, you know, every day. But uh, sometimes I make monumental things, maybe gateway can be, right? Or torum I can make, something like that. So, I mean, it's kind of challenging to me, you know, and varieties and different things I can. And Jenny, there seems to be this sort of a mysterious otherworldly element in your sculptures, or at least that's how some of our staff and interns <laughs> have described it. So I was wondering, what's your inspiration and what do you explore as you create your art? Well, I, my one of my main interests is always things that are in um, transformation or in a state of uh, fluctuation. And of course, I'm very inspired by natural phenomena, but it's not my desire to um, mimic nature uh, necessarily. And I think it's really interesting that when we see um, when we see things in nature like a landform or like some kind of strange sea creature, we often use words to describe them like it's unreal or it's alien or you know or otherworldly. And I, I'm really interested in evoking that kind of um, or, or or thinking about that kind of, aspect of, of it. And I think that when I make my work, I am pursuing a kind of um, tension between something that is familiar and unfamiliar. And so I often um, make things that appear to be, or I, 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 I hope that they appear to be changing um, in a state of changing or growing or changing into something unexpected. Um, I have um, I sometimes I make things that are like a box that is growing into like a cloud or like a blob that's got legs and striped all over. Um, and I think that um, there's something about it being a, a, a sort of recognizable and approachable um, image, but then having something that is um, possibly um, somewhat um, contradictory to that um, that I'm interested in and I think that um, I really like I really find it important to have that sort of hybrid and I think I, just to go to maybe another um, part of that uh, I think that that also does have to do with somewhat with this um, identity of um, you know being an I'm sorry being an immigrant and you know when you're an immigrant there's a lot of pressure from both sides, like the Korean side and the American side. Um, and no matter what, uh, there are like expectations on both sides and uh, you will seem sort of different or foreign to one side or the other, depending on how you're acting. And there's always a way that you have to, there's always like a little bit of like a suppression to what you have to do to, because no matter what, you know, um, you want to succeed in America and it, that makes you sort of minimize your differences and you want to be loyal to your Korean uh, heritage and, and community and that makes you sort of minimize your desire to conform to uh, the other standards. So I think that um, that in combination with coming into ceramics later in my life is also a sort of part of that um, 
showing a, a kind of unfamiliar or sort of a mixed side of something. Speaking of the mixed, mm -hmm. um, you've practiced as an architect for many years. So is there any sort of a, your architectural practice catalyzing in your um, clay art, or do you see any convergence between these two, or is it two very separate things for you? Well, I I was always interested in both, but um, when I went to architecture school, I really approached architecture as a sculptor. And I, in fact, when I was first at grad school, I just sculpted my architectural models all the time out of clay. And then eventually they were like, okay, you have to stop doing that. Um, and I did, and I learned, you know, and I did it the way that everybody wanted. But I'm like, now I'm like, maybe I should have kept sculpting the, the models. Um, and I think I always, and then I, you know, I always really loved architecture as a sculptural um, research. And the thing that drew me to architecture in the first place was a very kind of inspirational idea about how architecture um, envisions the future and and sort of creates the world. You know, it, it's very aspirational and very, you know, uh, very um, ambitious. And I think that, in some sense, like uh, unlike the practice of having a job in architecture, that kind of vision was the thing that I bring is the thing that I bring the most into my practice. Um, I I like the idea of kind of creating an imagined, you know, series of um, creatures or something that um, is a, is like a, is a sort of, um, you know, in that, in that aspect, it's a, it's like a more fantastical or, um, you know, even kind of sci-fi sort of. Otherworldly. <laughs> otherworldly. Um, <laughs> otherworldly pursuit and in and in some way that's the reason why mm -hmm. my pieces don't I don't have a lot of pieces that look like each other like I'm kind of really um interested in creating kind of con continuing to create um like populate uh this world do you mind if I ask a question <laughs> just <laughs> curious based on what you're talking about yeah. so th when you were talking about because I think about this a lot, like in your ceramics, you know, how you're sort of bridging like culture, right? As a, somebody who's born in one country and then living in another, does that come into play in your architectural practice? Or is that like wanting to express those kinds of experiences that you've had through the design of spaces? Or is that what led you to ceramics as an outlet? I think it's more the, sorry, more the latter because, okay. um, you know, I think that the reality of having a uh, having a firm and doing projects um, is um, is a separate, you know, or has been for us, um, you know, a, a separate responsibility. And then um, ceramics definitely uh, is the it's a more personal um, development for me uh, to do that. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, to, to me, is a common, you know, issues what. As an artist, you know, everybody wants to produce very unique work. It's each one of us, right, to be very unique, right? So maybe your approach seems like, you know, that's what you're trying to achieve it very uniquely. I mean, you know, in your own way. I mean, is is that the desire? I, I think and I always think, you know, I, I have a desire to make mm. my style. We can say that, right? But, you know, yeah. the unique work. Yeah, I mean, I think that in, in a lot of ways, um, going into ceramics and making the kind of work that I'm making, it's not, it's it's like I want to be able to be myself, you know, and be a lot more free than I was in my previous uh, job and, um, and to kind of not be afraid to do something that uh, is very... Um, maybe unique or maybe weird. I don't, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Steve, um, your piece in this exhibition, um, I, uh, sort of commemorate the victims of the Atlanta shooting of uh, 2021. 
was it your aim to sort of bring social awareness or was it a simple commemoration? What was your intent behind this piece? I think it was a bit of both, honestly. So that piece, uh, the creation of that piece coincided with the two-year anniversary of the Atlanta uh, spa shootings. And, you know, and I think that, like, in a way in this country, like, we've become so desensitized to, like, these sort of mass gun violence events. And that one in particular, it's like, um, I found that the women, you know, so it's six of the eight victims, you know, but six of the women that were Asian of Asian descent. And I felt like a lot of the language around that event kind of grouped or homogenized them as victims and categorized it in a way. And, you know, I think it actually, despite the sort of tragedy around it, it was a very, um, like it, it produced a groundswell of ac action that took place because in a way it, it invigorated the, like the stop Asian hate movement. And it kind of brought that conversation forward to a place where it's like, you know, something needs to happen. We need to like address this and kind of have a conversation around it for what it actually is. Um, and at the same time, the further I, I kind of researched the lives and the history of the individuals that were involved, I mean, their stories were so beautiful and they're so full of hope and they're and sacrifice and, and, you know, suffering really in a lot of ways. And I, I think that that wasn't part of the vernacular around like the press coverage. Um, and and a lot of the missteps, I think, that kind of happened like around the investigations and everything that was taking place. So it, it was a little bit of all of that, you know, just sitting back as an Asian American and looking at this event that did spur change and movement and, you know, and action. But it also like you don't want to leave those stories behind, you know, because they were unknowingly sort of sacrificed for that, hopefully that creates some positive change. Why did you choose the shape of plates? I I was thinking about like plates as a commemorative vessel, you know, so it's like ceramics, especially in the form of a vessel that's recognizable can become very decorative, you know, and sort of ubiquitous, like in a home. And I think that um, I like the idea of, of commemorating like a portrait of an individual on a plate, which, you know, we've seen that historically, because there's a certain amount of permanence to that, you know, where you can honor it in a special environment. Um, so that piece, you know, that's why I sort of chose that format was that, you know, each uh, individual was sort of dedicated, or each individual had a dedicated plate, you know, commemorative plate for their image and story. Um, and that's why the biographies that were included, to me, became an important part of it, so that you get to see a little bit more of the narrative of their lives as immigrants, you know, and people who had their own sets of dreams and goals in, in the world um, that were just as important as the object itself. But as you said, a lot of people think of ceramics or pottery as a functional items, um, especially if they are shaped as plates or a vase or cups. Um, do you think your work challenges the idea that clay art is meant to be functional? Because some of your earlier works also kind of play with that idea of the broken vest, you know, vase mm -hmm. and sort of twisted forms and non-functional pieces. Yeah, I think that um, ceramics is such an interesting medium because when it's in like craft form, so if you have like functional wear or things that exist in a domestic space, you know, as for use or for tactile kind of purposes, you know, it it's sort of seen in a certain category of value, I think. Um, but then when it's, you know, made into an object that's maybe s more sculptural, then it kind of separates in a, in a way. So that body of work for me, which, you know, I've talked to them about them as deconstructed vessels, it's sort of intentionally like breaking or allowing pieces to, f to fail in, a, in the way that maybe is the expected terminology, you know, but then for me intending to do that, it's actually not failing in the same way, you know, but I found that, you know, the reaction that people will have to that work is so tied to the expectation of what they think the thing should be based on their own life experiences. So if you have a vase, you know, um, we understand the vase on a level because we've all seen them and experienced them. But then when you see one that's, you know, cracked 
and slumped over, that first question that comes is like, did you mean to do that? Or was that an accident? Was that happenstance? And it changed the perception of how the individual would value that. So if you meant to do it, it's one thing. If you didn't mean to do it, it's another thing. And I, I just always thought that was really fascinating to me, you know, because I saw it from the other side as I started my career as a potter. And, you know, we'd make hundreds and thousands of these pots. And if you just had one little flaw, even though it was still function as a cup or a teapot or whatever, the value just disappears, you know? And I looked at it and I thought like the object is still an object. It still has its own individual characteristics and beauty attached to it, but it's disregarded. So I just really, I'm just fascinated by that whole like idea in the way that we sort of approach and assess value to different objects in our lives. And speaking of sort of thinking about the values of the um, ceramic arts, you led an organization um, basically devoted to excellence in ceramics and you have experience with a lot of teaching at the next generation and mentoring. Sungu, you are actually also a professor at university at this point. Um, is there anything that you hope to instill in your students? I think it's so exciting just to see the way that ceramics has gained so much, um, I don't want to say the word popularity because that's not quite it. It's it's just this excitement or interest, like a genuine interest in like tactile engagement with material because it seems like there is a real uptick in, in that post-pandemic, you know, and I think it was some reaction against our, like the separation of ourselves for, because of technology and people just wanting to get their hands into material and like manipulate things. Um, like we just got a tour of uh, Do Clay, which is a new studio in Koreatown that opened up. And we went there Wednesday night and there were probably 30, 40, 50 people there making work and they were all glazing and just, it was so energized and, and it was exciting to see the variety of different things people were making. And I thought that was really wonderful to see that, that it's, um, you know, because we all understand that on some level. Like, we un we remember the moment you just, like, things clicked and you get really, like, passionate and excited about it. And I think for that to be perpetuating and maintaining that energy is really great, you know, so it's not, it doesn't feel obligatory. It's like, I can't stop doing this, you know? Like, And I I love that that can get passed on to, you know, future generations of makers. How about you, song mm -hmm. And my intention as a teacher, probably, if I can, you know, teach students, I always, you know, say that uh, understand it's, you know, who you are as an artist, maybe. Understand what kind of material you're dealing with. And so lots of experiment, probably, I ask to do that. And by the time they graduate, you know, at least they can figure it out. <laughs> they keep on doing it or, you know, just go another, you know, directions, you know. So I think, you know, that's so important to me to teach. Students have to experience those, you know, rigorous, you know, process through those process then find themselves who they are. And if more and, you know, what kind of work they want to do, you know, do it's which is you know, really fundamental kind of questions, but uh, that's what you know they've been kind of experienced during the you know uh, school years. Then after that, you know, they explore their own directions. You know, so I'm trying to uh, students, you know, get some clue, not the you know answer, but you know some you know the the assets you know they can have, they can keep pushing, you know, their uh, directions, I think. All three of you sort of started this talk with talking about how much you fell in love with just touching things with your hand mm -hmm. and uh, the clay with your hands and how that sort of drew in. So I was wondering if we can talk a little bit more, more about that um, ceramic art is certainly very tactile. Mm. Um, the artist shapes clay with his or her hands. So what does it mean to you to use your own hand as a tool? Mm. 
I kind of can't believe that we get to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a privilege, really. It, it really is. It's a kind agree. of amazing mm -hmm. thing. And I mean, I'm very grateful for that mm -hmm. because I, I think that there's, you know, again, it feels like a lot of, uh, a lot of things are trying to separate us from that, you know, like technology and, you know, just the development, modern technology. Um, so the fact that we can deal in a, a, a pretty primitive kind of activity, but in a way that's very sophisticated, I think is, is pretty special. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's like, it's just joyful too, you know, like even though it can be very frustrating and it can be challenging, there is something like that just makes you feel some relief, you know, and I hate it when people talk about like ceramics as therapy or it's like, oh, it must be like a vacation or it must be so fun. Like, <laughs> I mean, it is all those things, but it's also like, you know, it can just be really obsession isn't fun, you know, but <laughs> but it drives you to new places and it helps you discover things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. And but you can also just enjoy on a very elemental level, like just kind of being playful, you know, and. I, I love that. I think it's really uh, a great thing to have as an experience. And, and I think too, to speak to what like Sungu was saying is that some of the people who work in ceramics may go on to become artists and some may not, you know, or like you're a great example. It's like maybe you, maybe you do multiple things, you know, and you can kind of marry them together. And I think it's like, that's the, the point isn't to me like that you become a ceramic artist. It's that, you get to use that experience to hopefully like inform whatever you're doing in life, you know, and, and open up some level of creativity or exploration. So I hope everyone can take a clay class, you know, and, and get to experience that um, or decide that it's not for them, you know, and move to something else. Yeah. Um, I really agree with, with uh, your earlier point. I think um, sculpting or, you know, using your hands with the clay is really a form of thinking, you know, or it can be a really a, a form of thinking. And I had, I have a friend who's like, oh, you know, it must be so nice to just turn your brain off, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and it's not that way at all. Um, but since I went to um, study architecture and then work in architecture, by the time I was doing that, it was all computer. Um, we didn't do any more hand drafting or anything like that. So it was basically all screen based. So not having touched clay for like 20 years and then going back to it, I really feel, um, you know, so strongly about what it means for me. Um, I think that, you know, because I, I didn't sculpt but still approached architecture as a sculptor, I got very heavily into 3D modeling. And I really intensely worked in kind of crazy 3D modeling programs that entire time. And I was really, I, that was what I was interested in. And I felt, I always felt like it was a very imperfect translator for what I wanted to do. Not because you can't do it, but because the technology affects the outcome in a way that um, I think a lot of times is not intentional for people. And then you just kind of leave it that way because that's the way the computer makes it look. And so um, coming back to uh, making, you know, it's like you can get a robot to play a musical piece like perfectly, but why, right? Because there, you need a person to do the artistry. So I think that that's how I feel about um, being with, the clay again and we do I do still um work a bit in our architecture office and I have you know I'm really I I, I have to force myself to sit in front of the screen at this point because it's so hard for me to do that I I do appreciate the privilege of being able to spend the time like thinking through making uh doing this hmm. I mean Touching clay, you know, it's amazing to me, actually. And uh, always, you know, after I finish it, right, you know, I amazed to me, too, sometimes. <laughs> right? how, how can I do this, right? <laughs> There's no plan, but, you know, it's started in some point and to the end. And then after that, you know, that's the, I think, you know, the, the process I really enjoy, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, touches, I mean, that, that's a meaning, you know, you leave your fingerprints in, in, in the material. Not many uh, mediums, you know, doing that only, I think, you know, clay can do it. 
And I sometimes you know, think about it, the future art, right? And uh, technologies maybe scan their fingerprint, my fingerprints. <laughs> yeah. So as a painter, there's uh, so many issues, right? Is it real history in a painting or not? But, you know, uh, I don't have to worry about it as a <laughs> ceramic artist, you know? <laughs> they can scan my fingerprints <laughs> somewhere, right? So, I mean, that, that's really important thing, and part of the, you know, process, I think, when, as, as, as an ceramic artist working with the clay. Mm. Yeah, I just want to add, like, I think that when you try all those, um, like, they still haven't made anything that can as, as sophisticated as, like, your hands, you know? There's no, I've tried, like, different things where you can carve away digitally and things, and, you know, there's nothing that, that uh, you know, technolo the, the original meaning of mm -hmm. technology is just know-how, right? Like a mm -hmm. stone tool is technolo was technology sure. back then, and and so I, th I still feel like the no. I, I think I still have the most know-how in my hands. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think technology augments the practice, right? But it's still being driven by an individual. I mean, it's sort of, I think of it a lot like cooking, right? Like where you have all these great tools to help make it faster, but yeah. I've never seen a machine that can just like from start to finish make food mm. that is delicious, you know? Like it's usually, it's it's a part of the process. You know, I think, ceramics or just art in general is similar where mm. you can use technology like you can have really great kilns you can have a potter's wheel a slab roller all this stuff but then in the end it's taking an individual to kind of like orchestrate all that into some final thing you know and you know and it it's a i don't know it's a beautiful thing to be mm. able to participate in that so the title of this exhibition is counterpoint because each one of you have very, very different styles. Um, I was wondering if you have noticed any interesting overlaps or intersections between different styles of ceramic art today. Well, I think the thing that I've always loved about ceramics is that it is so versatile. And, you know, there are some people that, like, there's, like on one end of the spectrum, you can just have glaze melting onto things that's very geologic or very, like, you know, it looks very natural. And then on the other end of the spectrum, people who deal with trompe l'oeil and make ceramics look like leather, you know? And everything in between that is sort of possible, even though it can be very challenging technically. But, like, it sort of meets everyone at their level of, uh, of, of like, inquiry, you know? So what, whatever the thing that's driving them to try to find the th end result you know, it can kind of meet a lot of those, uh, like, basic interests. So I think, I think that's exciting, you know, um, and I don't know. I mean, it just gives a lot of room for people to bring their own individuality, their own kind of unique perspectives into this material and then transform it into, like, a huge range of different outcomes. So um, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but I think that it, it's like, I, that's what I think is exciting is that there, there are trends that maybe overlap, but ultimately, like, it feels like it comes down to, like, where that one person is, like, trying to unlock something, you know? Yeah, I'm not sure if I am also going to totally answer your question, but I do think that um, ceramics has changed so much since I went to school for it. And um, when, back when I um, chose to major in it in undergraduate, it was very low on the hierarchy of the arts mm -hmm. um, because it was craft. And even when I was doing that, I felt very um, lost because I didn't knew I didn't have it in me to be like a production potter, but I didn't know what space there would be to do something else. I wasn't sure what you know where to go, and I think now it's clear that people are so drawn to it as a way of making things, and they all have an intention that is beyond not not you know that does that can be beyond functional um pottery or or production um production work so i just think it's interesting that um both the popularity like you're sorry to use that word but as you were mentioning before but i do think people are um really like coming to appreciate the fact that you can do that and mm -hmm. um and that they can bring their sort of different agendas to that mm -hmm. 
yeah maybe accessibility is a better word i was trying to think about that like it's popular but it's also just people feel like they can actually access it in a way maybe that they didn't feel they could perhaps compared yeah. to like drawing or painting where you feel like you have to have certain technique i yeah i think that about mm -hmm. drawing too is like i think ceramics or craft in specifically and drawing have the same problem is that they get applied with like mm -hmm. a scale of good or to bad mm -hmm. whereas like for me it's like drawing is just drawing drawing is expression and then you know so it's like when my kids were little i just wanted them to draw i didn't try to say it was a good drawing or bad drawing because that came later like then later mm -hmm. people would say oh that's a great drawing or that's not mm -hmm. such a great right like and i think as adults we carry that on but i feel like with ceramics that happens a lot in pottery you know it's like oh that's not a great handle or mm. it's a little heavy you know so we're, we're being a those kinds of criteria being applied by like industrial standards or you know other things that but i think you hope that you can just like leave that room for people to discover and just express and not feel like they're against some criteria of like mm. skill you know mm. So I don't know. I thought like maybe accessibility is good because it just feels like more people are like getting to the studios and being taught to like, just try it, just see what happens, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that's a really good thing because it wasn't always that way. It mm -hmm. used to be very rigid, mm -hmm. you know? I, I mentioned, you know, that uh, so each artist wants to have a desire to want very unique, you know, kind of, uh, directions you know and that's what i think you know it's commonly you know through the years it's commonly i can see right that's the that's the kind of you know trying i mean that's the effort you know to be unique so if new technologies come then people will start artists using you know new technologies to make their work unique right and uh even you know in these days there's a kind of stream we used to ban, you know, don't do it, you know, and maybe, you know, don't do it list, but, uh, st you know, that uh, bunch of uh, artists, you know, try to make those, the drippy glazes, you <laughs> know, something like that, melting clay. It's all those, you know, I think you know, that's what I see. Each artist wants to be unique, mm. right? And, uh, I mean, that's, you know, through the years, you know, it's kind of, you know, showing right so to me is it's you know what how can i be unique you know that's what you know we probably think about it as an artist you know that's uh which way we can really unique you know in our process you know that uh, make making art there's a if there's a mechanism then you have a very unique way to produce your art you know then we understand that maybe and I think, you know, more and more I see that, you know, especially these days. About 30 years ago, we kind of banned to use a plaster mold to create, you know, fine art. It was kind of banned, right? But these days, mm -hmm. many artists use a mold and sleep casting process to, you know, make their unique works, right? Yeah. So something like that. I mean, you know, it's, it keeps showing, showing, coming back, you know, which is uh, the efforts of... Uh, you know, what we really being, you know, new directions and be unique, or, you know, as an artist, maybe mm. that's, that's what I see these days. All everybody's trying, trying really hard, <laughs> whatever they grab, then they just, you know, apply that and try to, you know, their own vocabulary, they try to create, you know. So mm. well, the material gives you so much opportunity. For right. That. That's true. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. so many potentials yeah, and they you can know. go in any direction yeah, yeah 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 absolutely i think yeah it's it's expanded so much because i think before ceramics in america it was a little bit ins it was insulated let's just be frank about it you know so there were there was like judgments about what you should and shouldn't do you know make your own clay everyone should make their own clay you know and everyone should make their own glazes and and now like that's opened up it's like sure if you want to make your own clay make your own glaze great you know but it also is like if you don't want to spend your time doing that you can buy your glazes and buy your clay and then use that energy in other places so it provides more choice i think which is it it helps you 
understand how to like be more efficient with your energy too and exploration and like really focus on areas that you want to unlock, you know, and I, I think that's all really good, you know, mm -hmm. and even like craft versus art, like that's become, that was this like sort of debate that existed forever and, and it kind of held ceramics down in a way. But now I think in a way craft is celebrated for just being its own thing, you know, not opposed to art, but just in existence with it, you know? So, um, I don't know. I, I think that's a really wonderful thing to see that other people don't have to deal with those kinds of preconceptions and they can be a little bit more free to be like Sun Goo Sins. Like the, the hope is that you find individual expression and sincere interest in exploration, you know, not looking around and seeing how you compare to other people. It's like you're on your own road, you know, and, you know, people can help guide you on that. But ultimately, like you're dictating that for yourself, I think, you know. Hmm. Um, talking about preconception, there is a long history of ceramic art in Korea, whether it's the Korea blue celadons or the moon jars of the Joseon dynasty or the recent works. I was wondering as artists of Korean descent, um, if you ever think about that tradition of you guys are obviously not practicing in Korea, so you don't have to. But I was wondering if you ever think about the tradition and sort of your place in it just because of your birth. How about we start with Sungu? I mean, you know, I don't know. There's a one one thing I can say. That's what I like, you know, high temperature, you know, ceramics, maybe. Uh, our ancestors, you know, pretty much uh, use, you know, the clay make vitreous. And uh, that was a kind of rare mm. at the time, only in China, maybe, and, you know, Japan and Korea. That's, a, that's a, you know, in Asia, there's a few countries, you know, carry on those because of the technology, actually, that uh, at the time they didn't fi find the right clay in any other world. And, you know, they had a kiln, which is, you know, that uh, maintain high temperature than, you know, vitreous, you know, what their clays are. So, See, to me, I mean, I have a kind of, you know, the proud of myself about that, you know, our ancestors, you know, made a really, you know, high temperature vitreous stoneware and porcelains, you know. Mm -hmm. So I prepared to fire mine. And it's a difficult, you know, def definitely technically difficult. And clay moves a lot, you know. Then uh, right before I come here, I, you know, made a sculpture. Then there's a many figures in many sides and... It was a beautiful, except one side, <laughs> because <laughs> I fired too high. It's, you know, the figure died. Oh, I, you saw, know? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what <laughs> happened. But, you know, that's a risk. But uh, I, you know, take it because of my ancestor, I think, you know. Mm. And Yeah, You're, the glazes and, I mean, not only the figures, but the glazes in the high fire of your work really makes me think of some of the traditional Korean mm. um, surfaces. I absolutely loved uh, like studying Korean ceramics when I was in college, um, but I don't know uh, what my relationship to that is um, in my in my current work. I definitely think that because I'm start like I really I'm so new to ceramics right now. I feel like I'm I'm too old to just not do what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing or trying to do. That's great. Um, I, for me, my work does engage pretty directly with a, like a personal education around those objects. And I think for me, it's a lot of just trying to unlock like my own identity and history and as a Korean American and trying to understand like culture, the culture of Korea as it related to my ancestors and my family through the objects. And um, so I'm, I'm like deeply interested in that, in learning about those, uh, how the objects sort of mark what was happening in that moment of time in society, you know, so like Koryo dynasty, you know, Buddhism was very prevalent. So then the aesthetics were sort of based on Buddhist ideology. And then, you know, Joseon dynasty, it's like 
neo-Confucianism. So then the aesthetics change, right, based on the the ruling class at the time, you know. So I just find all of that really interesting, just in the way that it describes like human behavior and like you know philosophy, all of those types of things. But even on a base level, like sometimes I'm working on a vase and I'm trying to draw like a lotus flower, right? That I'm trying to copy out of a historical book, but then I just sit there and I think like a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, some or longer, like 400 years ago, somebody was trying to do the same exact thing. <laughs> like, how do you space it out? Right. Or just like, you know, basic kind of geometry or whatever. And, and like, we're connected by like our hands and my only sort of understanding of it is through an existing object that gives me some connection to what was happening back then. And I think that's pretty amazing. Cause like when I've had opportunities to handle work, I can just feel it and then sort of understand on some level, not fully, but how it was constructed, what the kind of con like the, the perspective was or the behavior around that. And, um, I, I don't know. For me, that's a really important part is like connecting to people from craftsmen from the past. Um, so I love, I just love looking at those objects and going to museums and, and seeing, you know, the remnants of things that we have from past civilizations. And then hopefully producing things that maybe people will see in the future. I, I mean, fingers crossed, right? If that's possible. <laughs> Well, on that note, um, once again, thank you so much for coming to New York and for uh, the, this exhibition, for participating in this exhibition. It's truly my honor that you all agreed to be in this exhibition, and it was such a pleasure to speak with all three of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank yeah. you.